historic night here in California. What affects you the most? Voters legalized the recreational use of marijuana. Here's a look at the Prop 64 results with 38%. Now Prop 64 creates two new taxes. So beginning what tomorrow, going into now marijuana. is Marijuana Incorporated. But you can't buy it until stores are it. licensed. Do you want a pot club in your neighborhood? What no one wants to say is we are a market that's competing with a shadow market that has just as good, if not better, a product as us for cheaper. How do we survive in that? You can ask anyone with business since they say you don't survive. It's unsustainable. We've seen a massive reduction in retail. Um, there's an estimate that at one point in time, there were more than a thousand brick and mortar retailers operating in Los Angeles County alone. And when you look at the, the number of retail licenses in legalization, there are currently less than a thousand operating throughout the entire state. Why different jurisdictions have these extreme caps is, is hard to understand. And, and I understand it's, it's a new use and you need time. Uh, I think we get that, but we've now had time. When they said legalize it, and they said they're gonna legalize it, People envisioned legal like lettuce. They envisioned an end to the black market. They envisioned an end to the cops and robbers game. After Prop 64 passed, it's this recreational thing, and the, the benefit that's supposed to come out of this is all this money that you get from the taxes. The problem with this is that all of a sudden the price is going way up and accessibility is going way down. It's getting harder to get and it's becoming more expensive. Pot was a felony back then. Any amount of pot at all was a serious felony. You could have a court trial, you could go to jail for a year or longer. So we saw things like, um, we have John Sinclair, who you can Google and look up, and this guy did, gave an undercover cop two joints and he got 10 years for this. It sent a lot of people to prison. It caused a lot of people to receive felonies for nonviolent drug offense, low-level uh, drug offense, uh, small possessions. Uh, and so when you receive a felony, it, it, uh, it uh, in, in, inhibits you from doing a lot. It was a very risky time. If you got in the industry, you were pretty much planning that you were gonna be in a court battle at some point and possibly go to jail. The AIDS epidemic was a catalyst. That was the thing that really put cannabis on the main stage and put it in the spotlight. And as people saw the performance of cannabis in, in the context of the AIDS epidemic, uh, it changed the way people responded to cannabis. As a young kid getting exposed to all this, it impacted me greatly because you could see how the cannabis helped these people. I never really wanted to be on the street selling weed. I always felt that marijuana should be legal and it should be something that you should be able to provide to uh, people that want it and need it. And that was very, very clear from talking to people that they saw uh, this type of business activity as a political activity. Um, you know, they saw themselves as freedom fighters. In the 90s, when suddenly the media starts covering the, the role of cannabis as a medicine, we suddenly achieved the ability to change the law. If all of this seems confusing, welcome to the brave new world of pot laws. San Francisco and Santa Cruz and there were a few other counties that had localized medical cannabis laws but the whole state didn't. When we were finally ready in 1995 to go out and start collecting signatures and putting together a ballot initiative that was on the ballot in 1996, the people of California were ready for, to, to, to go for it, and they passed it. Once 215 passed, all medical patients had access to medical cannabis. And so this was a major thing. We had 30 million people suddenly have access to medical marijuana legally. They stopped looking at it as a crime. 
They stop looking at it as a Schedule One drug and start looking at it for what it's really here for, which was uh, an herb with medicinal value. Really opening the Cannabis Buyers Club hey, hey. and changing the country and bringing back love to America. It was a very short law that basically created protections for those who create cannabis and those who use it. A wall of protection for us, nothing but protection for us. So what this meant is that cannabis wasn't organized on the basis of profit. It was organized on the basis of medicinal uh, provisioning and care and collectivity. In that period of time, you just had this massive influx of people into the to market. Cultivation blew up. It was really the b birth of cannabis cultivation in the, in the state. And the volume of pot that was being created went way up, the quality went way up, and the price went way down. You had a state law that gave collectives uh, state recognition and protection, but you had local governments not allowing it. It hadn't been formally sanctioned and hadn't been made legal, and so police were still raiding. Uh, city governments were trying to uh, resist or prevent um, dispensaries from opening up within their, their boundaries, and there was a lot of uncertainty. And they really all stem from the fact that we were trying to create a consumer access business structure against the backdrop of an exception to a criminal law. I don't think it was ever a realistic model that we were going to have the changes we've had in our criminal laws without some corresponding regulation. Prop 64 seemed to send mixed messages to the voters of California where most people had voted for legalizing cannabis but in fact, they were voting for regulation of cannabis. They were told a lot of sweet stories about how this was going to be done right, and it was going to generate tons of tax revenue, and all kinds of good was going to come from that. And none of that came out. The price was too high to afford. Nobody can afford legal pot. Very few people can. The black market is, is enormous. The money that they are making on the tax, they're just turning around and spending it hunting down pot. You know, I have a feeling Jerry Brown thinks that Proposition 215 was a joke. To get legalization to the point where stoners could smoke marijuana under the guise that they're doing it medically. And so once we had legalization happen, you know, they thought, oh, okay, this, this is the thing. People are just using this recreationally and they didn't really think about the medical aspects. Uh, this question about, you know, what's going to happen to the people that really pioneered the industry. Um, and I think a lot of what they feared has happened. You have the replacement of a not-for-profit care-based system with a new system that's based on profit and on competition. The existing cannabis industry has been regulated so hard and, and taxed to the hilt that the framework for Prop 64 uh, inadvertently has been funneling uh, a large consumer base to the unregulated market since, since its inception. We have not rolled legalization out aggressively enough. Licensing hasn't been issued aggressively enough and quick enough. Prop 64 has a clause that gives local authority of issuing that first phase of of licensing. Through that local authority, you can either choose to participate or choose to not. 60 to 70 percent of cities as well as counties ban cultivation or cannabis commerce in general. You have a really uneven situation where two-thirds of California's territory uh, still abides by the system of prohibition. And there was supposed to be business licensing and compliance support, um, and that was supposed to be a part of the social equity program, and none of those things to this date have been implemented. There was promises of billions of dollars in taxes. Those taxes were supposed to go to after-school programs, to rehab centers, to different areas that were going to impact and help nourish a community. And we're two years into legalization and that money has not been dispersed. Chain of custody for cannabis has added a step that at every point gets marked up 30% to 300%. You know, they just raised the tax in January. I believe it's only like a 12.5% tax and people are like, oh, that's not that much. But you're already paying 15% in excise tax. 
on top of a city tax, on top of a state tax. The people that need cannabis the most are the people who can't afford it. A big thing with the law that they did not address when they drafted it is the difference between commercial and non-commercial cannabis. In the 215 days, we used to do what they call compassion orders, which is just people with terminally ill diseases, which we would just give them medicine to. Because how the hell are you gonna tell someone who's dying of leukemia, hey, I gotta charge you $100 for that. Now, those days have long gone because you have to pay the taxes on it, and we get taxed on it regardless of how we give it to you. None of the compassion projects were consulted about how this law could affect them. And so legalization technically made compassion illegal. When you have 188 shops in the city of Los Angeles that are legal and licensed, and then you have about maybe 1,500 that are unlicensed, you know, it's kind of hard to compete with that. Uh, but when you open this up and license some more, then you begin, to, uh, you begin to be able to compete with that illicit market, and that illicit market will eventually disappear. When you take zoning restrictions, capped numbers, and licensing people for the first time, you wind up with these extreme horse races that you just don't tend to see. Those with the most capital and social resources are um, able most to kind of survive this regulatory environment, which um, wittingly or unwittingly is creating a situation where the barriers to entry are, are so high that, um, that it's making uh, the diversified and multi-scalar system that um, I think California voters envisioned Proposition 64 and also existed under Prop 215, um, that, uh, that that kind of system just is increasingly less possible. This industry is, we've been in a fight from the very beginning, and we have a responsibility, not only as a community, as activists, as owner and operators, but as elected officials, as policy writers, to make sure that this thing rolls out the right way. It's always been a struggle, but it's what we have to do. There's a lot of people, a lot of our members are relying on us, so I'm gonna see this thing through to the end. It's more of a process of us working with them instead of working against them because we all have common goals, which is to make this work. You gotta put the heat on the people who effectively change it. It ain't us. Oh, and I'm seeing it happen. I see the neighborhood council saying, wait a minute, wait, this can't happen. California being the fifth largest financial power in the world, our market should represent that. California being the mecca of cannabis. We need to represent that in licensing. Our imagination is the limit, and the political will is really what is required at this moment. Everything changed. This was a slow change. Each patient, each person, was really good at speaking about what their condition was, whether it was chemotherapy, whether it was glaucoma.